Hey, good evening, everyone. <laughs> There's been quite a group of people log on here, especially some people who we haven't seen, who have actually, that's not true, we've, they've been customers for a very long time. Uh, we're up to a pretty good group tonight. Um, I should say hi to Dick Berg, Greg Kinney, who has been one of our customers for a very long time. Uh, Chuck Cinnamon, Stacy Mills, Mike Ford, another longtime customer. Mike has, <laughs> we've worked back and forth and he's done all kinds of projects and things. It's very nice to see you, Mike. William Edwards, Tim Long, who's one of the key people uh, that has been with the ASCOM initiative for a long time. Um, and a Cracker Jack guy from the UK, and Michael and Karen Vandervorst. Hello, everybody. That's really great to see you all. This evening's topic is doing astro imaging with the scheduler, and um, let's just get right to it. First thing, um, I want to encourage everybody to ask questions. Please do. Uh, it, it can be kind of intimidating maybe, but, and also articulating your question, um, on this chat forum thing is maybe difficult, but give it a try. Uh, oh my gosh. Hello, David. Thank you for logging in as well. And Gort is the observatory <clears throat> at uh, Cal State Sonoma. Um, it got virtually burned out by a uh, wildland fire and they've brought it back from the ashes and they're bringing it back online and hopefully it will also use ACP. Well, they have a license and they're bringing it on online for that, but it'll get used for other stuff too. Hello, David. Anyway, um, scheduler is pretty much done. 8.2. I've been working feverishly since I got back. We got back from our uh, train trip um, and the last uh, field test was put out a week or so ago. Some very obscure problems that have actually been there since 2006. Um, and greetings to Australia, Paul Lucas. Um, since 2006, and a couple of guys popped up and um, called my attention to the user interface problems, and only a, a handful of people will ever see them. So... We're down to the wire. I mean, the the rest of all the stuff in Scheduler uh, 8.2 is is there, and it's being heavily used by several people. So we're good with that. Um, okay, imaging with Scheduler. When Scheduler was originally designed, it was designed um, to uh, support heavy duty uh, scientific imaging, and. At that time, I had mostly science customers for ACP, and I wanted to see if I could provide them with a way to get even more data and to stop and restart at night and in an intelligent way, which meant not just you know starting where you left off uh, because your targets will be in the wrong place and all that. Anyway, you've heard this story a million times before. Around, I'll say, eight nine, ten years ago, it became obvious that we needed to uh, add imaging to the capabilities of Scheduler, and there was really nothing about Scheduler that would stop it from being used for imaging, except conceptually handling the, uh, the needs of people, <clears throat> excuse me, who are taking long images over long periods of time, and that being the key. Um, an imager may want to acquire data for 15, 20, 25 hours on a single object. So how do you manage that in a way that doesn't just lock the observatory up and have it scanning from horizon to horizon all night on a single object? As you probably know, I've, uh, I've um, advocated with ACP because it's multi-target, multi imaging some of one target and some of another target, and then going back the next night and doing some of one target and some of the other. Well, with Scheduler, really everything is kind of done in a completely different way. And I'll let you, now we'll see how that works. Before I can describe that, however, <coughs> excuse me, hopefully that'll be the last time I cough, sorry. Um, before I describe that, I need to go back and review, and I don't really have a graphic for this, except I can probably bring up, uh, let me just switch, do a little of my own switching here as usual, uh, the Great Basin Observatory, and we'll go back over to the Great Basins, and I'll say a little about this at the end if we have time. Um, this is quite a, an interesting project. I did say, um, I did 
give some more information about it last week. Um, I also have my own uh, stuff here at home, which we'll use that at the office, actually, home and office. But we'll use Great Basin for starters. Anyway, um, the idea here is scheduler is organized in projects, plans, observations, and image sets. For uh, for astro imaging, you give it a, a project consisting of one plan, one observation, and one image set. Now let me explain why it's set up that way. If I go back over here to uh, something a little more uh, interesting, let's just see, how about uh, oh, an asteroid plan here? where we'd have a project for doing an, uh, an NEO survey and we'd have one observation, uh, a plan which consists of four observations. Now this are, that would be four separate runs to ACP. So here's the deal. A project is just a holder for work. It's just a way for you to organize things and you can turn them on and off. A plan is the thing that the scheduler looks at to decide whether it can start or not. So it's the minimum schedulable unit. I'm not going to spend much time on this but because I've gone over this before, but just to set the stage for how things are organized for astroimaging, I need to go back over this. So a plan is the thing that ACP looks at and says, okay, can I do this? Can I fit this in within the constraints, within the requirements that you've told me? If so, okay. <clears throat> An observation, on the other hand, is a run that is sent to ACP. So a plan might consist of multiple ACP runs. In this case, for the asteroid, it is indeed multiple ACP runs. One, and then 2,400 seconds or, 90, or yeah, 45 minutes later, another and another and another. So once ACP decides to start this asteroid, um, a grid, a, a place in the sky to look for asteroids, it's going to commit to do all four of those ACP runs. I hope that makes sense. I'm not going to belabor this. I just want to let you know that it's not, there's a method to why there are projects, plans, observations, and image sets. Oh, and by the way, image sets are the actual number of each filter that are taken. So you could have some, uh, you know, multiple filters. And we'll get back to that in a minute. On the other hand, for astroimaging, the whole point here is to give, and, and this is really important. If, I, if, I, if you don't go away with anything else, this is the most important thing. D dividing your work up into pieces that ACP can do within a block of time of let's say half an hour to an hour it's important because every time it finishes one of those blocks it can go back and look and see if the sky condition has changed or if it's time to do a periodic autofocus or if somebody else has put a piece of work in who which has higher priority um, let's say you've got a mixture of people like here at the Great Basin, you have both science and art imagers here. And so somebody may want to quickly go out and get inf info on a gamma ray burst and they'll drop something in there and, well, they can force your job to be killed in that case. But let's say it's not quite that um, uh, uh, high priority, but it's something like a supernova that they really want to get info on. They can put that... Uh, request in there and then if if the scheduler gets a chance to look at the landscape of its jobs every hour or less it works much better so the point is for doing astro imaging the idea is even if you want 20 hours worth of data you want to break it up into pieces well to do that if you didn't have some tools to help you put together your run, you'd be going crazy because you'd be um, operating in this uh, uh, schedule browser. And all you have here are the ability to create um, 
creating new plans, creating new observations, filling all this stuff in, creating an image set. Well, if you look here at NGC 281 at Great Basin, there are all of these plans that are sitting there. Again, each one of these is a unit of work that the scheduler can start. You can see some of it's been done. The thumbs up means that they've already been accomplished. These say that they're still waiting. That means, and they may get done tonight. Who knows? Um, that's another key thing. You don't know when you're, you're going to get your data because you can't predict, predict the weather. And the scheduler tries to do a really good job of deciding what to do when based on weather's unsafe, safe interrupts and things like that. So if you want to micromanage your observatory, scheduler's not for you. You just throw work at it, wait till it gets the job done, and watch your images come in. Anyway, that's the whole point of this is to divide the work up into pieces. Now let's take a look at what those pieces look like in the uh, project grid here again in the schedule browser. We'll go back to NGC 281 and we notice that there are 22 separate plans. That is 22 chunks of work that scheduler can decide whether to run and when. Out of that, there are 192 images that take up a total of 22 hours of imaging time. So far, 86% of that has been completed, 13.6% left to complete, no failures. And so if we go look at NGC 281, now we can go, that's the project, right? These are the observing projects. That's this level of the tree over here. Okay, so we can go down to NGC 281 and look at the plans, and that corresponds to all of these plans here. Okay. So if we look at these plans, we can see which ones have been completed, which ones have been deferred, and which are eligible. Um, and uh, we get an idea, all right, well, I don't have much left to go. I have, and each one of these things is one hour. So these, this, this, uh, job here, the, the, the project has been split up into one hour chunks. Let's take a look at one of those chunks just to see what's going on. Each chunk is a certain amount of time with a, uh, a, a given filter. So here's 12 images in blue. Okay, repeat count 12. So here we are, 12, 300 second images from 1 to 12. That's about an hour. So, oops, I didn't mean to close the whole thing. I just meant to close this. Each one of these things runs an hour. And as you can see, we do an hour of blue, an hour of blue, an hour of green, an hour of green, four hours of HA, four hours of luminance, four hours of oxygen three, two hours of red, and four hours of silicon two. That's the 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 recipe that uh, the the person who put this in wanted to do. So go back to the uh, project information page, and we can see there they all are, one hour. These are the ones left to do. So all he has is one of the one hour luminance and a couple of um, one hour reds. One thing I need to point out is everybody struggles with finding the ACP run log. Remember what I said that observations are the ACP jobs. Well, this is the, the level of plans, right? So within the plans, we can see observations for astro imaging. Go back here and show you again. For ester imaging, there is only one observation for each plan, and that's just the way it's set up. So let's look at the, um, the this one-hour chunk of green. There's the ACP run lock. Each observation corresponds to a run in ACP, and I think most of you have um, used ACP enough to know what a run log looks like. So here we are. And you can see all of the activity that went on during that hour to acquire the data for um, that target in green. 
So this is the easy way to find the run logs. You just go down here in the project information page. Um, by the way, clicking the, the word project takes you back up to the project level. And GC 281, now we're down to the plans for project and GC 281. Now let's look at one of the runs, which is completed. That would be the observations. And there's the run log for that one hour chunk of, of time. So I'm hoping that this is starting to make a little bit of sense. Now I'm gonna, we're going to switch modes here in just a sec. I'm looking at how it's laid out and how it's executed in the scheduler. Hopefully that has given you an idea of, of um, how things should be done. But now how do you do that? How do you do this observe? Uh, how do you do this observing strategy? I'm now going to switch away from Great Basin and go back to my own. Oh, let's have one quick look. Oh, it looks like uh, Great Basin starting up right now. That's cool. Here's an image that uh, they took from probably last night. Anyway, it's it's just starting up. It must just be getting dark enough there. Maybe we can come back later and take a look and see what it's doing. Anyway, we'll go to my local test system here. It's not live. I'm just going to show the the uh, the forms that you use to enter astro imaging requests into the scheduler, and then what happens um, to the actual. Uh, whoops, that's not what I intended to do. What it looks like in the project grid. Okay, so when we enter an astro imaging request, we use this um, schedule astro imaging form. Just move some of this trash out of the way. This is the simplest thing you could ever imagine. You And we're back to NGC 281, right? So if, uh, it, let's say we want to put in a request for 30 hours, you know, a bunch of time of NGC 281. I'm going to go through the process here of doing a full color plus narrowband for NGC 281 and show you how easy it is to get all of these millions of, of uh, plans and observations into the scheduler and then sit back and wait and see when your images start coming in. So, by the way, I should point out, I want to look at my notes to make sure I'm not missing something here. Not yet. Okay. And John Gwither and Paul, Paul Lucas, I already said hi to you, but hello from to you also. Again, I need to encourage people to ask questions. If you uh, if if something doesn't click, just say something, and I'll stop and go and answer your question. I'm watching the time. We're only 15 minutes in here, so and these things typically run for you know 30 to 45 minutes, so we have plenty of time. Please be encouraged to ask questions. All right. Okay, so here we are at the um, Astro Imaging form that anyone who logs in to uh, ACP gets. And this is how you put in your Astro Imaging uh, request. There's no other way to do this except through the web. So I want to encourage everybody to look for these help buttons when you're on the web. There's good stuff in here. Okay. So, um, I am going to put a couple of zeros in here to demonstrate something and come back in and say, okay, we want to do NGC281 and then click there. We got the coordinates. Now, if you're guiding, this isn't going to work um, as a rule. Well, if you have an external guider or a wide field guider, this isn't going to work. If you have a, uh, a system with a rotator, you're going to have to uh, set up the rotation angle, the position angle, and wiggle things around, get the guide star in there. Um, I can tell you there have been multiple attempts to automate this that have not worked out well. So um, it's no one's ever happy with the auto select for the guide star and the composition. So anyway, and that is a big problem. If you have students, especially try to stay away from rotators and pinhole guiders. If you can get away with unguided imaging, 
And you might want to think about this because modern cameras don't have the read noise that they did a million years ago. So you could be just fine with five minute images, maybe even 10 minute images if you have a really good mount. But five minute unguided images, bang, 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 bang. You're not going to get that much read noise, especially students are going to think it's wonderful and they don't have to mess around with rotators, field of view indicators, having to come up with a copy of the sky somehow, or I don't know what. It's awful, especially for students. So just especially Dave Kinsiski, think about somehow keeping things at five minutes unguided if you possibly can. So, but, okay, getting past that. Here's the key to the whole thing. I want to do Let's say, and I have this called clear, some people call it luminance. Let's say I want four hours of clear or luminance, and my subs I want to be 300 seconds. That's it. Now, I may want to come down here and tell it I want them to be above 40 degrees. And the moon avoid is pretty important for astro imaging. This, what this does, the moon avoidance is a constraint. It's a requirement. What that says to the scheduler is don't image this. Don't even start it unless the target is a certain distance away from the moon. And that depends on how bright the moon is, the phase of the moon. You may notice here there's a moon avoidance Lorentzian. That's what it is. Here's moon avoid help. Boom. And that puts us down into some help here. Thanks to Dick Berg for putting the spreadsheet, the live spreadsheet, into the uh, user interface so you can play with these numbers, the distance and width. By the way, the concept of a moon avoidance Lorentzian came from the Berkeley Supernova guys, uh, and um, it's, it's very useful. It's a good way to manage keeping clear of the moon. You also have the option of just saying the moon has to be completely down. You know, that that's pretty harsh, but you can do that. If you do, the moon avoidance, of course, becomes, you know, unimportant. It, it ignores that. So you can play with these numbers. Let's say 90 and 14, and there's a different distance. Mind you, when the moon is zero age, the moon age, it's over by the sun anyway. So your target, <laughs> even though it's you can be 40-something degrees away from it, it, it's irrelevant because it's daylight. So anyway, so there's uh, some info on the moon avoidance. We're just going to take the, the, uh, the suggested starting point of 120 and 14. Okay, so we'll put that in there. 120 and 14. Nope, wrong place. 120 and 14. I might show you that uh, the form does um, check your syntax and so forth. So this is all part of the live responsive web form. Then all of this also works uh, through a mobile device, if cell phone, iPad, Android tablet, whatever. So you can do all of this from wherever, whenever. I have a picture of Paul Gardner sitting on a bullet train in Japan, putting work into Great Basin because it wasn't busy while he was there. And he decided to take a bunch of pictures while he was in Japan. And he did it through his iPhone on the bullet train in Japan, which is pretty cool. So anyway, so here's our deal. We want four hours in clear with 300 second subs, no dithering, binning one. I'm, I'm going to gloss over the uh, autofocus and auto calibrate. Somebody, if you want info on that, that's fine. Um, David, there is not an ex a limit on the exposure time. You have to do that by policy. And people, what will happen is if your students put in a 1,200 second observatory and you have guiding disabled, they'll get trash and they'll learn really quick, uh, you know, and they'll learn something out of it, right? None this equipment isn't perfect. So they're, they will be operating within the limits of the equipment there and they'll learn something out of it. No, there's no way to stop them from shooting themselves in the foot that way. However, they'll get a bunch of a, a relative few images and they'll be really junky because they'll be trailed or whatever. So 
there's your answer and uh, onward, onward. I hope that makes sense. So we're going to do um, four hours and 300 seconds of clear. It has to be 40 degrees above the horizon, and the moon avoidance is the 12014. So depending on the age of the moon, this is how far away from the moon the object has to be. We're almost there. The, time, the sky condition I will get into in another video. If you have a way for you to get the sky condition, and this is not the same as weather or weather safety. This is how good is the sky tonight? Is the seeing really good or is it sort of good? Is the, for photometry people, how bad is the extinction? What, you know. So depending on your mission, you can kind of come up with a way to uh, tell ACP how good it is out there. You can also do that by logging in as the observatory operator and changing the sky condition checkbox in the scheduler. And at that time, the scheduler will shift gears and start working on things. Let's say you go from good to excellent. As soon as it finishes up the current observation that it has for excellent, it'll shift over and start doing things that require, I'm sorry, the, the observation for good, it'll shift over and start doing things that require excellent because now the sky is excellent. So it will do that. So just keep that in mind. Very few people have good sky condition inputs. So normally you would just leave this one alone. One last thing, block time. This is important. It defaults to one hour. However, with 300 second, which is five minute images, I would suggest you drop back to a half an hour on this. That's six images in each block. That's plenty. So we're going to do that. We're going to go to um, 0.5 on this. Now, I'm going to go ahead and put this request into the scheduler. And let's go quickly over to the schedule browser. And it does not automatically refresh. So we're going to look for NGC 281. And we will see 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 half hour blocks. We said four hours, right? So there they are. Now, this is not nearly as tough the next time. Let's say we want to go and do some red imaging. 300 seconds is fine for, with us. Everything else is fine. Boom. We submit it. That's done. And for the green, let's just say three. we still like 300 seconds. And everything else is good, right? Boom. We submit it. Now, for blue... We might want to increase the exposure time just a little bit, 450. Other than that, pretty much everything's the same still, right? Boom, we do that. And for um, narrowband, we'll go down here, and I don't have, I've got photometric filters in this system, so we'll just do an H alpha, and we'll say, um, you know, 600 seconds, double what we did uh, for the uh, wideband. That's maybe we'll just go to, ah, let's, let's uh, say, no, I really want to do 900 seconds. All right. Well, now we're getting pretty long. 900 seconds, eh? Well, let's go ahead and put 900 in here. That's 15 minutes. And in this case, we should probably go ahead and make these one hour blocks, not 10 hours, Denny, one hour. By the way, when you hover things over these little um, symbols, you get some extra help, which is kind of nice. Unfortunately, that's not showing up on the uh, streaming video. Darn. It must be a limitation of the video capture that does the streaming. Sorry. Um, I just, I'm glad I looked at that. Anyway, we're going to increase the block time to one hour. Now, what that means is it... Uh, what did I say? 15. That's goofy. 900 is what I really wanted. I'm glad I looked at that. All right. And each one of those is four hours, right? I've been going back and saying four hours of, of each color, including narrowband. But let's say I want eight hours of this narrowband also. Because, you know, we want to bring out all that extra detail. So we're going to do eight hours at 900 seconds. That's 15 minutes with one hour blocks. Boom. All right. We've got a pretty decent heavy duty amount of work that, that we've asked our observatory to do for us on this object. Let's go over to the schedule browser and take a look at what we've put in. 
and GC 281. Whoops, I meant to go back here. Let's go back and look at this again. There's a lot of stuff in here. That's why it's taking so long. Um, so we have 208 images in 24 hours of observing time. You know, imagine doing this by hand and dealing with uh, fog coming in from the Pacific Ocean and then going away and or nights when the wind is blowing out of the east and it's beautiful or whatever. Um, so uh, this is I have one customer who lives in Colfax, which is east of San Francisco, up in the Sierras, and he has fog that comes in and covers him up until late at night so he depends on the scheduler to um, detect when the fog has finally pulled back and the air the uh, downslope the mountain downslope has cleared that fog out and he gets beautiful sky conditions at that point but it's like midnight or one so he starts everything up in the evening goes to sleep and then at one o'clock the scheduler opens up and starts things up and does his observing. He's a, we'll talk about him when we get into science imaging. This may be, the astro imaging thing may end up taking two of these videos, I don't know yet. Um, but when we get to the science side of using uh, scheduler, that will definitely take two videos because there's a lot there. So we'll get back to him that and talk about him at that time. So we have 24 hours, and let's take a quick look at what we put in here now. We have a lot of plans. And you can see that, that the blues and the clears and the greens are running at a half an hour each. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, right? Now the HAs, one through four, and each one of these has four 900 second images for an hour so each one of these things is going to be an hour long and we've got all these sitting out there for narrow band they're double the length and there's half as many of them so the point here is that this this form here makes it really easy i didn't put a stopwatch on this and i was blabbing a lot while we were doing it but once you kind of get into the swing of things you should be able to put in a mini hour mini filter request for hundreds of images inside of 60 seconds really certainly two minutes that's not much work and now it's just sitting there and you can go do whatever you want. And as the days go by and you're and things happen, you're going to see stuff come back and just pop into your Dropbox. And we've talked about how to set it up, set the Dropbox delivery up and all of that. And that's a fundamental thing, especially for um, a remote observatory to have the images delivered by Dropbox. All right. Let me go back to my notes here. I did talk, I have it here, mention the use of field of view indicators. Um, I Let me look at the time. It's 6.33. Let me just cover some other things which I think are important about putting the work in. And then if we have time, I will run a quick video on how to uh, set up an observation for astro imaging with a field of view indicator and we'll use the sky. There's a video out there. So I may end up just pointing you to that video um, and letting you watch it yourself instead of having dragging everybody through it. So autofocus, how does this work? What, what goes on with astro imaging with the scheduler for autofocus? You have two choices. One choice is to have people manage their own autofocus. And I should mention that if you, I highly recommend that you measure the focus offsets of your filters when you install the software and bring your observatory online so that as filters are switched, ACP will change the focus on the uh, 
uh, f- to correspond to the focus change. Yeah, there's a lot of f- filters out there that are sold as parfocal, but if you <laughs> if you go through the measuring process, you'll find out they're they're more or less parfocal, but they're not really exactly parfocal. And you can get the very best out of your system by measuring that uh, the focal focus offsets. And that's all done automated. There's a script to do that. Um, if you have some very narrow band filters in there, there's some extra stuff you have to do. I'm happy to help you with that. There's info on in ACP help on how to set up a dummy filter thing so that it'll force it to use brighter stars for the narrow band filters to get a good focus. Or you can use auto, um, sorry, focus max's own star selector and let it do the selecting, which works really well. So there's a bunch of ways to get that done, but it's a one shot operation. Once you've done it, once you've run the automated process to get those filter differences, after that, changing filters, it's just it's just a focus change and off you go. So you don't have to focus on filter changes. If you are, you're wasting enormous amount of time and you're risking because autofocuses aren't perfect. Sometimes they just flat out fail. So, but if you want to, you can have the ability for people to um, uh, use the autofocus. And what that does is that will force the scheduler to focus be- before it starts one of those half hour or one hour blocks. And the scheduler will do that with its own logic. It goes out and looks for a star high in the sky, runs focus max uh, and or PWI, which is the plane wave autofocus, depending on what kind of system you have. So, or you can set it up when you install the software to have a periodic autofocus uh, where you say, okay, I want this thing to focus every X amount of time. Now I'll mention that AC that scheduler 8.2 has a, has a focus schedule built in. It's not just a fixed interval. So if you have a system which needs to be focused more often at the beginning of the night, and then as the night goes on and the temperature um, you know, gets stable, you can get away with focusing less and less often. You can now put a series of intervals into that um, periodic autofocus field, and it will start, and it'll focus after a half hour, then after an hour, then after two hours, and after four hours, or whatever you put in there. And that's a new feature that is coming up uh, with ACPA, or I'm sorry, Scheduler 8.2. That is correct, Stacy. Uh, this is 8.2. The autofocus, the autofocus box. If you look here, it says, if you hold your, uh, you can't see that. Autofocus management has been disabled. What I did in order to make this uh, focus box appear is now. Let me see if I can get this. Uh, I'm going to try to start the scheduler here and show you where. ACP scheduler, I'm going to bring it up for simulation just so, and put myself into this mode here where you can see everything on my right hand screen, move the scheduler over here and then uh, configure. I have periodic autofocus set to zero. So that's telling the web browser that the system is never going to focus. It's up to you to focus. So that's why the autofocus box is there. If you turn this autofocus now, watch me. This is going to be tr- this is going to be fun because oh no, it won't. I have to bring the scheduler up live. The the simulated scheduler ain't going to work. Hold on, let me do that. Just let me kill this and bring it up the right way here so that I can um, show you this. I'm sorry about that. That was just a let's see scheduler normal. And then for that, I need to switch to its normal ACP way. At that point, now, okay, here we go. Configure. Let's turn the periodic autofocus and set that to two hours, let's say. Okay, at this point, now that this has been... This is an installation thing, right? 
I mean, this is not something you do when you're going to observe every night or whatever. These settings in scheduler are things that an engineer would do in the observatory, and then the users keep their cotton-picking hands off all this, right? But if they have it set up for periodic autofocus, and then um, you you come back and look at the form, you'll find ah, it made a liar out of me. This thing is supposed to, this is obviously something I need to check before I release the next version. This was not supposed to show up. It, it is supposed to detect that the periodic autofocus is, um, I'll make sure I got that right. I knew I was taking a chance. I did. Okay. Well, um, that's something I've got to, uh, these forms I have to do. There's a whole bunch of regression tests that I have to do on these forms. And this is one of them. Normally this would not show up when you have periodic autofocus set. So I made a liar out of myself, but that's okay. Anyway, you get the idea. And, um, Hopefully, I don't see the chat anymore. There we go. So I'm sorry, Stacy. That's the reason you don't show that box, that you don't see that box. If you turn your periodic, periodic autofocus to zero, disable it. And I'll bet you there's something I, I didn't do something here. Anyway, um, it, it will show up. But I would recommend using periodic autofocus and keeping the, uh, unless you're one person and you want to control that yourself, which is fine. And you're welcome to do that. So those are the uh, the uh, the options you have for autofocus, periodic or manual, which is each one of these things you put in, um, you have to tell it when to focus and when not to. Okay. Now, calibration. Calibration files. And what I call cal frames are darks and biases. I kind of try to treat flats as a separate issue here, although it, they are also a calibration file. Darks and biases are set up, and I'm not going to go into how to do this. This is all part of uh, um, what uh, engineering. On the For the scheduler, you set up a schedule of taking darks and biases, and that's done at the end of the night after it's the observing time is over with. If you have to do sky flats, they'll be done after, right after the observing time's over with. And then the next thing that'll happen is it'll do um, darks and biases. If you have a panel, well, it's just actually the same thing. It'll finish up. It'll When it starts to get bright enough, it'll close and then go to the panel and do your flats and then your darks and biases. So the observatory engineer or you, the user, if you're the only person that uses it, sets up a standard plan for darks and, and biases. And then those things are executed every morning. So, and that happens when you, um, oh, I'm going to start this back up again and I should have left it running. Okay. Move this over and then go here. These evening flats and morning flats. And right now, uh, my system's set up for uh, um, panel flats. But anyway, there. Now you're seeing the um, the the help, you know, the uh, tool tips, but they don't show on the on the web for some reason. Well, that's again my screen capture. Anyway, so turning these on will cause that to happen, and there's a way to set it up what you want done when that when that does happen. I'm not going to get into how to engineer and set up and and install the software here. This is for users how to how to aster imaging with the scheduler. And I'm sorry, what I meant was morning calibration frames. That's what you turn on to get the darks and biases. My apology. Um, the flats is a different issue, which I'm going to get into next. No surprise there. Um, again, if you want to ask me questions, please do. Finally, how to set it up to do your flats. Two possibilities, screen flats and sky flats. Sky flats require 
um, the sky to be at a certain um, brightness. And so uh, they, they, and there's a limit to how long you can take those flats before the sky starts to get useless. If it gets too dark, you end up with a bunch of stars in there, even though it's um, dithering, you're still going to have problems and it's going to be a crum crummy flat. And earlier in the day, it's going to be so bright and also not uh, the gradients are going to be there. So there's a there's a magic spot, and ACP knows about that. It was done as some research, and um, the scheduler and ACP both know how to do sky flats pretty well. We haven't had any complaints about them for years, once you get them dialed in. Panel flats, different situation. It will lower or point the, 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 the scope to a flat panel. You can set it up to be a different brightness for each filter. Um, and also for each binning, and it will also manage uh, if the flat panel is mounted to a rotating dome, you can have it um, move the dome to the correct azimuth so that the scope can point to the flat panel um, and also with the right um, out and as for the scope. So everything's there, and you just turn on, uh, again, uh, the evening or morning flats. Most people, I think, do morning flats and morning calibration frames, and that takes care of what you can do. If you're short on time and you need more flats, then you would turn evening flats on, and you can have a separate plan with separate filters in the evening and in the morning if you need more flats uh, out of sky flats. With a panel, it's kind of not worth fiddling with that. Just run them all in the morning, assuming you don't have any light leaks or uh, significant light leaks. If you have light leaks, you may not be able to do flats during the day with the panel, just to keep that in mind. Now, for a big, big quirk problem. If you have a rotator, remember what I said earlier about rotators and pinhole guiders and field of view indicators and all of that? Here's another um, wrinkle that that brings up. There is a school of thought that says that the flats you have must match the rotation of the uh, images. Some people say, no, the, the dust motes are on the camera or on those things and they're behind the rotator. Other people say they come, they come from the optics ahead of the rotator, so you have to have it rotated. I'm not going to get into that argument. In fact, I don't even know. It's more of lore than I'm maybe. I don't know. Anyway, uh, and it depends on, this, on the particular observatory, right? But... You may decide that you need flats at various um, rotations. What do you do when the scheduler goes and runs around to a bunch, does a bunch of different work during the night, and you end up with images from different plans with different rotation, different um, objects, right? Because different objects are up at different times of the night. So it's going to be jumping around. It's going to try to do your work near the meridian at well near the uh, the the meridian is at the lowest amount of air as possible and this been the best air so you're going to get data from different targets and if you set those up with the field of view indicators with different position angles and all of that now what do you do how do you get these flats so this is the big the really big issue for um, a school setup or whatever it's an, it's an impossible thing. First of all, these students have a hell of a time with the field of view indicators and all of that. And secondly, who the heck is going to do all the flats and get them to the students? Because you don't even know what's going on. Now, I've been asked to provide a feature which looks at all of the stuff that's been done in a night and then takes the corresponding flats in the morning at those PAs. I It's on my list and I may yet do that. Um, and uh, it, it's tricky, but I may yet do it. Here's what my thought process is. The state of the art is advancing to the point where I think these rotators and pinhole guiders may become kind of a dinosaur technology. Um, they're getting there already. For example, at Great Basin, that, that system has a really nice mount, and some cameras that are so good that they're taking short images, 300 second images, and they're really just fine unguided. You know, plane wave selling these L5, LXXX mounts like hotcakes, and they can take five minute images all day. Well, once you get to that point, you don't need to guide anymore. 
all kinds of stuff is 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 solved by that. All kinds of quirks, problems, hand wringing, and everything. So it's you know I'm not sure that 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 the technology isn't going to cross the corner with me putting this um, automatic generation of what flats at what angle you need. But I may yet do it. It's not going to be an 8.2, that's for sure. But it's up high on my list and, and probably will end up getting done in the next release if if the technology hasn't progressed a little bit more. All right, we're at 650. We're getting probably right towards the end here. Uh, I think I've covered everything in my uh, uh, in my outline. It worked out really well. Uh, we reached pretty much the end. If someone has another question, go ahead and ask it now. Um, I will take a quick look here at Great Basin. Let's go over and see what's going on there. Um, here's the Great Basin Observatories. Uh, ah, here's, I should bring this up. The, this is an, uh, a, an automatic monitoring plan, and I, you've probably heard of Tabby's star. It's a very interesting variable star, um, and there is a, there's a plan there that runs every night automatically uh, to get photometric data on that star, and it's uh, uh, nobody does anything. The guy that has the, uh, the, the project set up, let's look at the um, schedule browser. I think it's this guy... Um, Fawcett, yeah, Jacob Fawcett. If you look at this, um, what's that called? Fawcett UNR, right? Where is that here? Um, I should mention that, uh, here's the one that's running with the smiling face. And that's the plan. And if you look at the project, no, that's the plan. It has a monitor interval on it. What this does is this means that that plan is resubmitted automatically every night. So Fawcett doesn't really have to do anything. These images that he takes of, ta of the Tabby Star end up in his Dropbox in the morning. Well, as they're as they're acquired, actually, they're being shipped into his Dropbox over the over the night. And so every day when he comes back into his office um, at you know univer let's see UNR right University of Nevada Reno. There are a bunch more images of that uh, star, and it's pretty popular and pretty. There are a lot of people who are monitoring it right now, so that's what uh, is happening right now at Great Basin. And he's taking a time series of that. We can look at his um, run log here. No one is present at Great Basin, and they only go up there once every few months, um, as far as I know right now. Uh, this thing's been running for four or five months, and that that was an upgrade. They're scheduled to do another upgrade this weekend, so I know the engineer's headed up there. Probably well, tomorrow's Friday, so he'll probably be headed up there tomorrow. Anyway, you can see the observatory's running. Nobody's there. Nobody's pushing buttons. Nobody's doing anything. The scheduler's completely in control of this. And actually, what I can do, I didn't mean to close that. My Sky, that's our wonderful My Sky service that we offer people. It must be downloading an image. There we go. All right, let's go to the schedule browser again. Not sure why I was what I was going to do here. Let's see. Well, anyway, um, oh yeah, the the um, scheduler engine lock. So here's what's been going on with the scheduler, and it, it, again, at this uh, at this obser this observatory is in a national park. It's the first science observatory ever. It's totally hands off, no visitors allowed, and it's run remotely by students at four different universities. So here's the startup stuff, and then the first thing it decided to do is start. Um, looks like it was doing some NGC 6543. It did that for a while, and then it shifted. It should be shifting gears, and and um, uh, now it's running the uh, Tabby Star. Okay, so you can see it. Uh, it is. It's just doing what it's supposed to do.
selecting targets and running things. The the monitor idea is something that somebody gave me about five years ago, and it's for science again. We'll get into all that when we do the science imaging thing. So that's it. Um, I think we've I try to stay to keep these things under an hour, and we are just under an hour. So I hope you everybody uh, got a lot out of this. I really appreciate it. Let me see. We had 21 people in right now. That's excellent. And for those of you who said hi at the beginning, thank you. We really appreciate seeing that you uh, are logged in watching. And um, to the degree that I can help you in future videos, there is a, uh, um, I should promote this, by the way. Uh, sorry for jumping around, but there is a, suggestion box here right in the, the top of the comm center that if you if there's something you want to see or if there's a comment that you have about these videos please put it into the uh, suggestion box and then the other thing would be to please um if you haven't already subscribed to our channel please do so when you push the subscribe button here um, you'll get a bell next to it, and if you push that, you will end up being notified of all of our future videos. Um, I'm going to go ahead and keep these. Oh, Tim Long, by the way, thank you very much. I know it's like the crack of dawn there. He lives in, um, in Wales in England, and uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm glad you joined. I don't know when else to do these. I try to kind of hit some time, so... We've moved it from Saturday to, to Wednesday night, and um, I think we're going to stay here for a while. And, but if you have inputs, please put them into that suggestion box. Thank you. And with that, I will say buenas noches, as they say down here. And um, oh, a video link. Yes, uh, that would be important. Um, I, will t I can't put the video through on here. So... Um, Stupid o'clock. Yeah, I get it. Michael and Karen, please um, send me. I'll tell you what I'll do in the. Uh, <laughs> hey, Tolga. All right. Let's see what I can do about this. Um, let's go back to the comm center. I, I'll tell you what. Let's do this. Let's um, go here. The link to our live TV is here's the way to do this. All right just took me a minute to figure out how to answer your question um, on how to get to the video link. Oh, Mike, I'm glad. Okay, so let's go back here. So to get to our videos, listing of live DC3 Dreams live TV right here. Click. All right. That will take you to our YouTube channel. And that's the live part of it. But, oops, up um if we can get to the channel well i'm in i'm you know what i'm gonna have to point you to the whole darn channel and i don't have that right now um up on here so all, all this does is get you to the live videos i will um uh if you will kindly darn it let me do this youtube dot com slash dc3 d-r-e-a-m-s-a-s-t-r-o youtube.com dc3 dreams astro okay that's our that's our channel and here we have playlists okay once you get to the playlist you can get to using the sky with acp and here it is internal and off-axis guiding with rotation I'm hearing that, and I don't think you are. Let's see. I think that's right. Here we go. And then you can just play it. In this video, we'll use the SkyX to compose an image for a rotating. That's kind of too big for this. Guider. Then use the. So there's the video I was talking about. Position angle to take a single image with ACP. We're going to image M33. So. Okay, so that's uh, that's the video. Okay, everybody. Once again, I'm I'm now I'm really getting up to the end of uh, end of the line. Um, I hope everyone enjoyed it. I hope uh, you learned stuff. I'm uh, happy to see all these people in here. Tolga, Mike, um, Ron, Diulio. That's good too. 
uh, a lot of people, actually. Gosh whiz. So thanks for um, watching, and we will see you in two weeks. Bye-bye.